but welcome back once again to the educational channel on biology. In this video, we're going to discuss the molecular trial 2023 biology paper 1, and this is part 2. So, part 1 has been discussed. Now, in part 2, we're going to discuss questions 21 to 40. They are all objective questions or multiple choice questions. So, this is part of the revision of form 5 topics. There are lots of box questions in this uh, part of the video. So let's sharpen our skills in answering box questions. Right, let's get started right now. Question 21 of the Malacca 2023 Paper 1 trial paper, what happens to the primary oocyte when a female child reaches puberty? So what is puberty? It is the time in a person's life when his or her body starts to physically mature okay, and is capable of reproduction. So more FSH, LH, estrogen and progesterone are produced in the body and hormones like FSH and estrogen cause the development of the oocyte, okay, which is the immature egg. So let's recall back the process of oogenesis. This is the flow chart. You can see that at first, primordial germ cells undergo a mitosis to form oogonia, many oogonia. This occurs in the ovary of the fetus. But once the uh, girl is born, there are many, many uh, primary oocytes. Okay, the oogonia develop to form the primary oocytes. Then, uh, for a period of 12 years, uh, nothing occurs to these primary oocytes. Then when puberty hits at around 12 years, then the primary oocyte undergoes meiosis 1 to form the secondary oocyte and a polar body. Okay, The primary oocyte will divide by meiosis 1 to form the polar body and a secondary oocyte. So the answer here is that is D. Huh? The primary oocyte undergoes meiosis 1 to form the secondary oocyte and the first polar body. Okay, This stage here. Now, uh, then next, after that, the secondary oocyte will undergo meiosis 2 to form the ovum and a smaller polar body. Okay, But we are talking about the primary oocyte, so it's this stage, the first stage of meiosis. Primary oocyte undergoes meiosis and divides meiosis 1 and divides to form the secondary oocyte and a smaller polar body. Question 22. Which of the following substances are found on the cell wall of cholenchyma tissue. So cholenchyma tissue consists of cholenchyma cells. It's a type of tissue, right? Where the there are thickening, there's thickening of the cell wall, especially at the corners. So the thickened cell wall is made up of pectin and hemicellulose, right? So the answer is number one and number four. Okay, so answer is D. Question 23. Diagram 11 shows the graph of the growth of corn seedlings which are exposed to two different types of music. Okay, So that means you let the corn seedlings be exposed to music like classical music and rock music and then measure their growth, Okay, their growth rate. Maybe measure how tall they grow, the height of the plants from day to day all right, or from week to week. And what do you think is the control? Now, the control probably is a group of plants that are not exposed to any type of music. Okay, just quiet, all quiet. So this is an interesting experiment. And you can even try this as a school science project. Right? Just let corn seedlings grow and expose them daily to uh, uh, some type of classical music or rock music, different groups of plants. Eh? and then measure their growth rate. Maybe, maybe, maybe measure how, uh, how the height changes or increases with time. So which of the following statements is correct about the growth? All right, so here we have to note here that the, for classical music, the growth curve is higher. It shows that the growth rate is higher okay, than for rock music. So rock music seems to have the, a negative effect on the plants. Okay, you no. Know, what's rock music? Rock music is music that is that uh, is very loud, you know, and fast, maybe fast-paced. Okay, where there's a lot of drums, 
drums and guitars, uh, guitar, uh, guitar playing and so forth. Uh. Classical music is more soothing and uh, sweet and maybe the piano is used usually uh, to play the classical music. Guitar also can. Uh. So these two types of music are different, right? Now, so just like uh, humans have preferences for certain type of music, maybe plants too, you see, uh, tend to prefer certain type of music, okay? And uh, they may grow better in when they're exposed to certain type of music. So which of the following statements is correct about the growth? So you can see here that uh, for classical music, the curve for classical music is higher than for rock music and shows more growth. So our inference here from this is that plant cells divide more actively when they are exposed to classical music compared to rock music. Okay, so now let's get the answers. Active growth, growth occurs when the plants are exposed to rock music. No, it should be exposed to when they're exposed to classical music. B, plant cells divide actively when exposed to classical music. So that is the answer, right? C, oxygen hormone stimulated actively when rock music is played. No, uh, you cannot say that. And then rock music is wrong also. Okay, and we cannot say the hormone is stimulated. Uh, it's wrong. Now, more abscisic acid is produced when classical music is played. Okay, it's, that's not right also. It should be, uh, perhaps, uh, perhaps the cells will release more oxygen hormone or the hormone oxygen. Okay. In when they listen to the classical music, when they're exposed to classical music, okay, then that's why the growth rate is higher, okay. Question 24. Diagram 12 shows the compensation point for plant P and Q, all right. So here we have the rate of carbon dioxide uptake against the light intensity, okay. So rate of carbon dioxide uptake against light intensity, huh? Now, there are two plants shown here. The curves are for two plants. Plant P above and plant Q below here. Alright? So, let's try to understand the graph before we answer the question. What is the meaning of this graph? Now, in this graph, there are three parts. That is, the curve below the zero point, below the horizontal axis here. Alright? And then, at the zero, uh, at the horizontal line and above the horizontal line. Okay? So, there are three parts to the curve. Now, below the horizontal line, respiration, the rate of respiration R uh, is more than the rate of photosynthesis. And carbon dioxide is uh, released by the plant. Okay, more carbon dioxide is produced to respiration than is used in photosynthesis. Okay, and the carbon dioxide is released by the plant. All right. Then, continue with uh, this point here uh, at zero point. At zero point, respiration, the rate of respiration equals the rate of photosynthesis, and whatever carbon dioxide is uh, produced through respiration is all used up in photosynthesis. Okay? So there is no excess carbon dioxide. So what's compensation point? Compensation point is the level, is the level of light intensity when the rate of respiration equals to the rate of photosynthesis, and no carbon dioxide is no net carbon dioxide is released, neither is any carbon dioxide taken in by the plant for photosynthesis. Okay, so for a compensation point of plant Q, this is at 10 units of light intensity huh, of the light, and for plant P is at 19 units, okay, of the light intensity, right? So going upwards, then we have Photosynthesis, the rate of photosynthesis now becomes higher than the rate of respiration. Okay, so let's take the curve for plant Q. Now you can see it goes upwards. It means that as the light intensity is increasing here, the rate of photosynthesis is increasing and it's becoming uh, more, it's coming faster compared to the rate of respiration. So more and more carbon dioxide needs to be taken in from the environment, all right, for to cater for the higher rate of photosynthesis, to be used photosynthesis to produce uh, glucose as the light intensity becomes more and more, right? Now, let's look at the question. Which of the following is correct about plant P and Q? 
A, plan P reaches compensation point earlier than plan Q. Is that true? So look at the curve uh, for plan P and Q here at the compensation point. Actually, it's plan Q that reaches compensation point earlier than plan P. That means at a lower light intensity, plan Q has already reached compensation point, where the rate of respiration equals to the rate of photosynthesis. Okay? Uh, plan P is later. So this uh, statement is wrong. It should be plan Q reaches compensation point earlier than plan P. Now, statement number two uh, for B, uh, plan P carry out photosynthesis earlier than plan Q. Okay, for this part, we look at the curve below the zero x, uh, below zero point here. Uh, so below the horizontal line. Now you can see here that uh, in this part of the curve, right, both plan P and Q actually do carry out photosynthesis early, but for plan Q, it seems to be increasing at a faster rate, uh, the rate of photosynthesis, compared to plant. Uh, for plant Q, the rate of photosynthesis is increasing faster and it's absorbing the sunlight efficiently okay, to carry out more and more photosynthesis. So rate of photosynthesis is much faster, right, compared to plant P. So this statement is wrong also uh, for B. Now C, plant P produces more glucose than plant Q. Now, for this statement to be true, we actually have to look at this part here. Okay, which clearly, we can clearly see that plant P, okay, around uh, 40 units uh, for light intensity, plant P is having a higher rate of carbon dioxide uptake compared to plant Q. Okay, so if plant P is having higher rate of carbon dioxide, Uptake means more carbon dioxide is being absorbed by plant P compared to Q, and plant P has a high rate of photosynthesis compared to Q, and plant P produces more glucose at this point here uh, compared to plant Q. So the answer is C. Plant P produces more glucose than plant Q. Okay. Now for D, plant P absorbs sunlight more efficiently than plant Q. Now this doesn't seem to be true because you see here, plant Q is the one that achieves the compensation point at a lower light intensity than plant P. Okay, so it seems that plant Q is more efficient in absorbing the sunlight even at lower uh, light intensity is already reached its compensation point. Alright, so the answer is C. Question 25. Diagram 13 shows the condition of the leaves of a chili plant planted by a housewife. Now, which of the following kitchen ways can be used to help overcome the problem? Okay, so you look at the leaves, huh? it's all sort of curled inwards, right? So this type of condition is due to a lack of calcium, all right? When there's a lack of calcium, the leaves become distorted and looked like this. Huh? Distorted in the sense that it's curling inwards, okay? So uh, what is the remedy or the solution to this problem. You must supply the plant with enough calcium. So which is the source of calcium? It is the egg shards. Okay? So answer is A. Question 26. Diagram 14 shows the apparatus of an experiment to study the transport of water in a plant. Right, so at the beginning of the experiment, we have a cut plant stem cut here, and this stem is connected to a rubber tubing which is connected to a, a capillary tube, okay, a glass tubing, okay, capillary tube or glass tubing. Next, after some hours, uh, first we mark the original water level. Now, after some time, we observe the that the water level has increased, okay, as Increase showing that water has uh, been pushed out of the stem and into the out from this stem here and into the uh, tubing, the glass tube. Okay, so what causes the increase in the water level? So, what is the factor that causes the changes in the water level at the end of the experiment? Okay, so uh, this experiment, which is also explained in the textbook, is related to the force called root. Pressure. The answer is A, root pressure. 
and we are going to explain this on the next uh, in the next slide. All right. So the answer is root pressure, and let's see how it occurs. Why? How does root pressure cause the water level in the tubing to increase? How does root pressure cause water to move out from the cut stem? Okay, from the roots to the cut stem and out into the tubing and to the glass here, glass tubing here. All right. So the explanation here will be explained. I will be discussed in the next page or next slide. So let's look at this picture, okay? Which shows you the movement of water molecules in the roots. Now, this is taken from one of my videos on uh, the transport of water in plants, okay? You can refer to that video, it's a four or five video. And uh, here we can see this is the section through the roots, huh? the longitudinal section through the root. And we can see the root hair cells here, okay, which is exposed to the, to the soil. And here we see uh, the movement of water by osmosis from one cell to the other to another in the roots until it reaches the endotomies and then the pericycle. All right. Now, actually what happens at the endotomies is that uh, the root pressure force is produced. Now, how is root pressure force produced? Which pushes the water uh, into the xylem vessels in the roots and then up the xylem vessels in the roots. Okay, and up the step. So at first, uh, there is the active transport of mineral ions. Okay, the root pressure is caused by active transport of mineral ions, which uh, require energy from the root cells into the root side. Okay, so from the root cells here, right from the endodermis, and through the pericycle into the xylem vessels in the roots. Right, so first there's the active transport of mineral ions from root cells into the root xylem here. And then next, the mineral ions accumulate in the root xylem here and they lower the water potential. Okay, because the concentration of solutes or mineral ions increases as the mineral ions are actively transported into the xylem vessels. But this will cause the concentration of water or the water potential in the xylem vessels to be lowered instead. Okay, when the solute concentration increases, the water concentration, water potential decreases. Then, because of this, water diffuses from the root xylem uh, into the root xylem from the root cells, right, by osmosis. So this is the red arrow. Okay, so blue arrow denotes the active transport of mineral ions from the root cells into the root xylem, and then the red arrow is to represent the diffusion of water into the root xylem by osmosis. Okay, so as more and more water accumulates, then it causes the force called the root pressure force. Okay, and uh, this force pushes the water up the stem. So if the stem is cut at the top here, then the water will come out or exude out from the stem and it will go into the capillary tube and cause the increase in the water level after some time, okay, in a cut step. Right. Question 27. In an experiment of plant tissue culture, a researcher has added different ratios of phytohormones into the two cultured mediums at an end. So diagram 15 below shows the growth that occurs after the callus is left for a week. Okay, for uh, test tube M, or boring tube M, you can see that a lot of shoots and leaves have been produced or have grown. And for N, the roots are have grown, but the shoots have not grown. Okay, so M shows that the shoots are growing well, but there are not many roots are growing. Whereas for N, it's the other way around. The roots grow very well, develop very well, but the the shoots do not grow. Right now, which of the following is the match of plant hormones that cause the growth for M and N? Right? So this is a question where you either know it or don't know it. Right? And it's based on the knowledge about tissue culture and hormones. So it's been found that uh, different concentrations of hormones can affect the growth of the plant. Okay? And a more cytokinin, this is a hormone, huh? cytokinin. So more of the hormone cytokinin will induce or stimulate 
the growth of shoots as shown here, right? Whereas more auxin induces the growth of roots as shown here, induces the formation of roots, okay? So the ratio of auxin and cytokinin affect the growth of the plant, which part of the plant will grow faster. Now, so for M, the auxin is low and cytokinin is high, all right? That's why the shoots uh, grow well because they are stimulated by the hormone cytokine, okay, that is in a higher or greater amount. Whereas for N, oxygen levels are high, which induces the growth of roots, okay, while cytokine levels are low. So the answer is A. This is a hot question in that it's based on uh, more advanced knowledge about tissue culture, okay, which was not discussed in the uh, textbook. Question 28. Diagram 16 shows a longitudinal section of a flower, okay, with the parts R, S, U, and T labeled. Now, which of the parts labeled R, S, T, and U produces the embryo sac? Okay, so embryo sac is found in the ovule, right? So it must be T. Okay, the answer is T. This is a simple recall question. Question 29. Which of the following statements is correct about the double fertilization process? This occurs in plants. Huh? Okay, so read through the, the answers. Now, tube nucleus secretes hydrolytic enzyme to digest the star tissues. So, this is not related to double fertilization yet. Okay, copper helps stimulate the growth of pollen tube during germination. This is not part of the double fertilization process. Deprot zygote is formed from the fertilization between one male gamete and one egg cell. Yes, this is true. Okay, it's just like for humans and animals. Uh, Deprot zygote is formed from the fertilization of a male gamete and a female gamete. So C is the answer. Now the two haploid antipodal cells were fused with a male gamete to form a triploid endosperm nucleus. That's wrong because it's actually two polar Nuclear eh, will fuse with the male gamete to form a triploid endosperm nucleus. It's not the antipodal cells. Okay? So answer is C. Question 30. A farmer has hung mature corn cobs that he harvested for a few weeks until they dry to become seeds. What is the most suitable method to store the seeds so that they last longer? Okay? So uh, mature corn cobs. That means these are the uh, jagong, eh? we call it jagong, that's, which consists of a lot of seeds, right, that are attached to a structure, right, the yellow colored uh, structure, right, from the, the plant, the fruit of the plant. So what is the most suitable method to store the seeds so that they last longer? Okay, so first you must know what are the conditions for the germination of the seeds, okay? Now, what do seeds need in order to germinate? So they need light, oxygen, water, and a suitable temperature to germinate. So we must avoid all this and make sure that the seeds do not have all these conditions so that they will not germinate. Okay? So seeds can be stored in an airtight container to eliminate the, the, the air or oxygen and in a dry condition without water to pre prevent the germination. Okay? In a cool, dry place and also a dark place. So the best answer is C, store in a dry airtight container, airtight you know, to eliminate the, the oxygen uh, that's needed for germination. Okay, because oxygen is used uh, for cellular respiration in the seed to cause uh, energy to be produced, okay, to produce energy for the process of respiration. Okay, so the container must be airtight. Question 31. Diagram 17 shows a parenchymal tissue found in plant X. What is the habitat for X? So let's observe this tissue here. Now you can see that uh, it could be probably a stem or root. okay? And you can see that it has a lot of these air spaces, right? So this is a clear sign that this is 
the erythema tissues found in the hydrophytes that live in water. Okay, so the erythema tissues contain the air spaces to help the plant uh, become lighter so that they can float on water, right? So the the answer is uh, in the fresh water lake. Okay, answer is B. Question 32. Diagram 18 shows the roles of microorganisms in the nitrogen cycle. So what are microorganisms P and Q? Okay. Now let's have a look at P. P is living in the root nodules of the leguminous plant. Okay, this is a leguminous plant with the beans uh, hanging down. So P is the rhizobium species bacteria. Okay, that lives in the root nodules of the leguminous plant. And this bacteria can fix the nitrogen in the air okay, to, and convert it to become the uh, ammonia compounds or nitrogenous compounds in the roots of the leguminous or bean plants. Whereas, um, you can see for Q, Q converts nitrites, eh? NO2 minus nitrites, to become nitrates. Okay, so uh, recalling back the nitro uh, nitrogen cycle that we have studied, now NH4 plus is the, are the ammonium compounds. They are converted by the bacteria called nitrosomonas species to become the nitrates, nitrites, okay, N-I-T-R-I-T-E-S, nitrites. And then nitrates, nitrites are converted to nitrates by Q. So Q must be the bacteria known as nitrobacter species. Okay, so the answer is A. This is a simple recall question. Question 33. Diagram 19 shows an innovation to overcome the increasing number of cases of an infectious disease. So in this picture, we uh, see the process. All right, whereby the Wolbachia bacteria, now the English version doesn't have the word bacteria, so double check with the Malay version, all right? So Wolbachia is a type of bacteria that is injected into the eggs of the Aedes mosquito, all right? You can see here that uh, it's related to the Aedes uh, mosquito because the virus is the dengue virus, okay? As mentioned in the question later on. So this Wolbachia bacteria is injected into the eggs and then it will cause the female mosquito that grows okay, uh, from the eggs huh, to be infected with the Wolbachia bacteria itself. Now, if it mates with a wild male mosquito, it will produce eggs that do not hatch. So this is the effect of having the Wolbachia bacteria all right, in the female mosquitoes. Okay, so what is the Wolbachia bacteria? It's actually a type of bacteria that can help uh, us control the population of the mosquitoes, especially the Aedes aegypti mosquito that causes the dengue virus, that causes the dengue fever. Okay, so the question is, what does this method, how does this method control dengue virus transmission? Okay, as mentioned in this uh, question here, right? So first of all, uh, we know that dengue virus, the dengue virus enters the female Aedes mosquito through a blood meal when the female Aedes mosquito bites an infected person who has dengue virus. Then the dengue virus goes into the female Aedes mosquito and then it will replicate or reproduce in the mid gut of the mosquito. So the gut means the digestive system, or the intestines. Now, so the mosquito acts like a host for the dengue virus, and it allows the dengue virus to uh, increase in number in it. And should this infected mosquito bite a healthy person, then the dengue virus will be transmitted to the healthy person. The person will suffer from dengue fever. Okay. Now, then you have this microorganism called the Wolbachia bacteria. So notice there are two microorganisms here. First is the dengue virus. Now, if the Wolbachia bacteria is found in the uh, Aedes mosquito, 
it will prevent the growth of the dengue virus in the mosquitoes. Okay, so it's the enemy of the dengue virus. And uh, if it prevents the growth of the dengue virus, then dengue virus is not transmitted when the infected mosquito that is supposed to have the dengue virus bites a healthy person. Okay, so in this way, the cases of uh, dengue fever, occurrence of dengue fever can be reduced and has been proven to be reduced, okay, through the use of this Wolbachia bacteria. Now, Wolbachia bacteria, as we can see here in this picture, also prevents the mosquito eggs of the infected mosquito, of the female mosquito that's infected, from hatching, all right? So when the mosquitoes do not hatch from the eggs, it means that the population of the Aedes mosquitoes will be reduced. And this can prevent the replication of dengue virus in mosquitoes because the host is already reduced in number. Okay, So the dengue virus will not be able to replicate in the host also because the Wolbachia bacteria pre actually prevents the growth of the dengue virus in mosquitoes. Okay, And now it can prevent the hatching. Wolbachia bacteria also prevents the hatching of the eggs. So let's see how this method controls the transmission of viruses, okay, according to this question. A, it prevents the replication of dengue viruses. So this is the correct answer. Why? Because by preventing these eggs from hatching, it means that the Wolbachia bacteria reduces the population of the Aedes mosquitoes, including the female Aedes mosquitoes, okay? And thus, it will reduce the replication of the dengue virus in the mosquitoes, which act as the host for the dengue virus. Okay, so A is the correct answer. Now, B, uh, let's look at B. Causes mutation to occur. So no mutation is mentioned uh, concerning the Wolbachia bacteria. It doesn't cause mutation. Now, C, reducing the lifespan of dengue virus. Now, that's not correct. You say reducing the lifespan of the mosquito, which is the host, then it's correct. Okay, so uh, it reduces vector resistance towards pesticide. Okay, nothing to do with the vector resistance or mosquito resistance towards pesticide. Okay, for Wolbachia bacteria. Question 34. The following information is about the relationship of the number of living organisms on the different trophic levels of an ecological pyramid. All right, so there are three types of ecological pyramids. The pyramid of numbers, pyramid of biomass, and pyramid of energy. All right, so here it's talking about the pyramid of numbers, but the statement seems to refer to the pyramid of biomass. Okay, where it says more number, it should be greater number of organisms with higher biomass when trophic level is increasing. For example, in the food chain, in the lake, the individual fishes, okay, small fishes, have a greater biomass than each individual zooplankton. Okay, you're talking about individual organisms. However, this statement is a bit uh, confusing, but let's look at the question. Which of the following is correct about the ecological pyramid? So A, a number of zooplankton generations able to eat a generation of phytoplankton. The word, uh, this sounds a bit confusing again because of the word uh, generation. Okay, that means maybe it's talking about different generations of, uh, many generations of zooplankton eating one generation of phytoplankton. All right, let's uh, skip this first and look at the other answers. The number of zooplankton is higher than the number of small fishes. Now, this is true for the pyramid of numbers in the lake. Okay, as you can see from the diagram here, the phytoplankton is the producer in the lake. Okay, it contains uh, chlorophyll, so it can carry out photosynthesis and produce organic food substances. So it's a producer in the aquatic environment in the lake. And the zooplankton are tiny creatures too that eat the phytoplankton. All right, so... Uh, then the zooplankton is eaten by the small fishes and small fishes are eaten by the bigger fishes. So as we go up the pyramid, the number of uh, organisms at each trophic level becomes less and less. But the size of the organism or biomass of each organism increases. Okay, So the number of phytoplankton is bigger than the number of small fishes is correct. All right? 
as you can see here, the zooplankton, uh, number of zooplankton is more than the small fishes. Okay, so this rectangular box representing zooplankton is uh, wider, okay, or longer, okay, broader than that for the small fishes. All right, then the third answer C, fishes have a larger biomass because they have longer lifespan. Not necessarily true because it's also genetically determined. Doesn't mean the organism has a longer lifespan, it will grow to be bigger. For example, the African bay parrot, right? It has a long lifespan, about 80 or 90 years, but its size is still small, its biomass is small. Okay? So D, biomass in each trophic level depends on the lifespan and the ability of the organism to adapt. Again, biomass at each trophic level depends on the lifespan. So this uh, statement seems to tie in with this statement C. So this is also not really correct. Lifespan or isn't directly related to lifespan. Okay, so the best answer is B. Best answer is B. Question 35. Diagram 20 shows one of the effects caused by the emission of greenhouse gases into the environment for, a, for long term. Okay, So uh, in this graph of amount of greenhouse gas in the atmosphere against the years, we see that there's an increase in the amount of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere through the years, Okay, till beyond the 2000 mark here. Okay? The greenhouse gases keep increasing. The level of greenhouse gases keep increasing. So uh, this causes the rise in the sea level because the ice at the caps, uh, the polar, at the poles uh, will melt and then the, the water will uh, flow into the sea and then increase the sea level. Okay, let's look at the question. What factor that contributes to this phenomenon? So this phenomenon is the greenhouse uh, effect or global warming. Okay. Now, A, deforestation for agricultural activity, B, burning of fuel for transportation, C, emission of pollutant from industry, and D, generation of electricity from, from fossil fuels. So these are all causes. Many of them are the fact of warming, but which is the main factor? So it has been found that the generation of electricity from fossil fuel is the main factor. Okay? That contributes to the phenomena, the greenhouse effect and global warming, okay, that causes the greatest increase in the uh, in the level of the greenhouse gas, okay. So a power plant or power station is used to generate electricity and to generate this electricity, uh, the power plant needs to have an energy source such as from the burning of fossil fuels like coal, oil and natural gas. So in the year 2014, okay, from the analysis, it was found that generation of electricity from fossil fuel caused about 30% of greenhouse gas emissions, the most of all sources of greenhouse gases. Okay? And this is followed closely by the burning of fuel for transportation, also burning of fossil fuels right? But for transportation. So that is in the year 2014, uh, but uh, in 20 25 onwards, we are not sure. Maybe I uh, maybe the burning of fossil fuel for transportation may also be one of the main factors really. Okay? It's between these two, D and B. So D is the answer. Okay, given generation of electricity from the burning of fossil fuel is the main factor that contributes to the greenhouse effect. Question 36. A marriage of spouses who have different research factor produced the first child with a positive rhesus factor, or a first child was rhesus positive. Okay. However, the following pregnancy ended in stillbirth, meaning the child was born dead. Now, what is the genotype of the, what are the genotypes of the parents and the dead infant, the dead baby? Okay. So, uh, normally for this problem with different rhesus uh, condition or uh, problem with the uh, rhesus factor is always related to the mother being rhesus negative and the baby being rhesus positive. Okay, so mother is rhesus negative can produce a baby who is rhesus positive because the father may be rhesus positive.
Okay, so if you look at these uh, answers here, all that are given here are the genotypes, and you have to deduce whether the parent or child is rhesus positive or negative. Let's look at the father first of all. Rhesus positive father must have at least one Rh positive allele. Okay, uh, so this is rhesus positive father, this one too, this one too. These three are rhesus positive fathers. Now, rhesus negative mother must have two Rh negative alleles. So this is the one. All right. So B is the answer straight away. All right. And then the rhesus positive, the baby that uh, died is probably is is rhesus positive. Okay. And there is a uh, incompat incompatibility in the blood between the blood of the mother and the baby that leads to this uh, condition, which we're going to discuss in the next slide. Okay. As part of revision. So the answer is actually B. Okay, the father is rhesus positive, mother is rhesus negative, and baby is rhesus positive. Okay, and this causes the stillbirth. Okay, let's revise how this occurred. Let's go on to the next slide. Now let's see the problem with the rhesus factor. Huh? If the mother is rhesus negative and the fetus is rhesus positive. So problem arises in pregnancy if the mother is rhesus negative, but the fetus is rhesus positive. Okay, now for the first child, if the first child is rhesus positive, the first fetus is rhesus positive, okay, now in the ninth month or so, the rhesus factor from the fetus can enter the mother's blood through the placenta. Normally, mother's blood and fetal blood will not mix, okay, but in the ninth month, uh, bits and pieces of the red blood cells containing the rhesus factor, which is a chemical substance, from the fetus will enter the mother's blood and go into the mother's blood circulatory system. So as a response, the mother that is rhesus negative, that doesn't have any rhesus factor in her red blood cells, will produce the antibodies, such as it's like an immune response, okay, against the foreign substance, which is the rhesus factor. All right? So the antibody is called the anti-rhesus antibody. It will enter the fetal blood through the placenta again. Okay? Now, in the first pregnancy, the level of this uh, anti rhesus antibody is quite low, so it will not cause any harm to the fetus. Okay, but in the second pregnancy, if again the fetus is rhesus positive, the rhesus factor again will uh, enter the mother's blood in the later months. And now, this time, the anti rhesus antibody level from the mother increases, it will, the mother will produce even more anti rhesus antibody. On the second exposure, okay, to this rhesus factor, so uh, anti rhesus body from the mother will increase in the second pregnancy, and when these antibodies enter the bloodstream of the second rhesus positive fetus, it will react with the rhesus factor in the blood, the red blood cells of the fetus, on the red blood cells of the fetus, okay. And then this will cause the agglutination, that means the clumping together, and hemolysis, meaning the bursting of the red blood cells of the second fetus. Right? So the fetus will have less red blood cells to carry oxygen and suffer from anemia. The condition is known as erythroblastosis fatalis. Okay? So this is how. A problem can arise in pregnancy if the mother is rhesus negative and the fetus is rhesus positive. Question 37. The ability to roll the tongue is determined by a single gene. This gene has dominant and recessive alleles. The allele for able to roll the tongue is dominant to the allele for not able to roll the tongue. So Devin 21 shows the inheritance of the ability to roll the tongue in a family. So this is called a pedigree diagram and in here we can see the two generations. Uh, first is the other parents. One cannot roll the tongue, so uh, this is denoted by the white color. And square box is for the father, okay, married to the mother here. So uh, mother, the uh, black box or black color circle here represents uh, the ability to roll the tongue. Okay, you can roll the tongue. So then below are the children. One is not able to roll the tongue, and another two can roll the tongue. Okay, so they're all uh, girls here. Huh? 
circles. So the question is, what is the probability of the next child of the same parents having the ability to roll the tongue? What's the probability of the next child having the ability to roll the tongue? Okay. So first, we must know the genotype of the parents. And to find out the genotype of the parents, we have to, uh, first of all, uh, give a symbol for the allele for able to roll the tongue. Okay. Let us use R. Uh, R, the R. Since it's a dominant allele, allele for ability to roll the tongue is, is dominant, so we use a big R to represent the uh, dominant allele for ability to roll the tongue. Okay. And small r represents the allele for not able to roll the tongue. Okay. So the type of inheritance is just simple Mendelian inheritance, monohybrid inheritance. Okay. So what are the genotypes of the parents? Now, first, the father is not able to roll the tongue. That means he has a recessive trait. And his genotype is that he is homozygous recessive. And only he will show the recessive trait. So that means he has two small r elements. Okay? Two small r elements. Whereas mother is able to roll the tongue, that means she must have at least one big r element for ability to roll the tongue. Okay? But as you can see here, the children will give you an idea what the genotype of the mother is. Now look at this child here. She is not able to roll the tongue. That means she has two small r alleles. One small r allele comes from the father and one from the mother. Okay? So that means mother must have the heterozygous, uh, his heterozygous for the trait of ability to roll the tongue. Okay? Okay? She has big r because she is able to roll the tongue. And then uh, she has small r because you can see from this child here, which, who is... Uh, recessive, who has a recessive trait, you can see that this child has two small r alleles. One is from father, one is from mother. Okay? So mother is heterozygous. Now we now know the two genotypes of the two parents. So we can draw a genetic diagram to show and to calculate the probability, probability of the next child having the ability to roll the tongue. Okay? So let's try and draw a diagram. First, in the diagram, we are going to show the genotypes of the parents, okay, which are big R, small R, small R for father, and big R, small R for mother, okay. So this is the genotype of the, these are the genotypes of the parents. Then find out the gametes. Now, father will only give a uh, we only produce one type of gamete with the, all of them have small r allele in them. Okay? Because during meiosis, these two small alleles will separate and move to opposite poles and they will be found in different um, gametes. Okay? That are formed. So all have the small r allele. Now, for the other parent, the female parent, since she's heterozygous, so, uh, during meiosis, we have to separate the two alleles, huh? okay? And then, 50% uh, of the gametes from the mother have the big R allele, and 50% have the small R allele. So then, in fertilization, combine, huh? combine the gametes together during fertilization, as the sperm and ovum will fuse together. To form the zygote. Okay, so we have the results. That is the children. Okay, the first one, first type will be big R, small R, and the second uh, type will be or second child. Uh, possibly will have this uh, genotype small R, small. R. Okay, okay, because we we'll just do the crisscross method and uh, find. Will be true here. Okay, now big L combined with small r, so you get big R, small r, and the second one, small r combined with small r, you get two small r elements. So, to calculate the percentage or probability of the next child having the ability to roll the tongue, 
So out of two, now big R small R means can roll the tongue. Small small R genotype will ex, uh, have the trait of not being able to roll the tongue. So it's one over two, half. Huh? And then for percentage, we have times by 100%. You get 50% as the answer. Question 38. So, which of the pollen is the type of gene mutation that causes sickle cell anemia? Right? Right. So, here we see uh, three types of uh, mutation, gene mutation uh, or point mutation. Now, let's identify the types of mutations here, first of all. Okay? So, for P, you can see that uh, it is substitution where the base C, cytosine, is replaced with the base T, tiny, all right? Now, this is uh, found, this is a cause of sickle cell anemia, all right? Substitution is a type of mutation that causes the sickle cell anemia, or sickle cell anemia is caused by the mutation uh, known as substitution, okay, in which one uh, base is replaced by another one okay C for example C is replaced by T okay uh, so another case let's look at Q now Q in Q the in between the G and C the three uh, bases are inserted inside uh, T A T okay uh, so Q the type of mutation for Q is insertion where three bases one or more of one or two or three bases, for example, three bases here, is inserted into the uh, base sequence in the DNA model. Okay, so cystic fibrosis is caused by the mutation called insertion. All right. Now look at R. In R, the base bases C A are removed. Okay, they are removed. So R is a type of mutation called deletion, where the bases C and A are deleted, okay? And they are cancelled or taken out from the base sequence. So thalassemia is caused by the mutation called deletion, deletion okay? So uh, a type of deletion uh, mutation or type of mutation called deletion occurs in the uh, disease called thalassemia. So the answer for uh, this question, what is the type of mutation that causes sickle cell anemia and thalassemia, uh, thalassemia also? So it's B. Okay. B substitution causes sickle cell anemia and Q and R, uh, R, uh, which is deletion, causes thalassemia. Okay. Now, this is just a revision to you, all right, concerning the types of mutations and examples. So, based on the question just now, let's just revise through the types of mutation. Now, um, this is a very useful diagram for you to jot down to about the different types of mutation, all right, which is a popular question in the exam. So, there are two types of mutations, gene mutation and chromosomal mutation. The one we're discussing in the last question, previous question, is gene mutation. Or point mutation, all right, and examples are sickle cell anemia and albinism. So, for gene mutation, there's a change in the nucleotide base sequence consisting of the bases adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine. Okay, a change in the normal nucleotide base sequence of the DNA or the gene. Okay, and this causes changes within the genetic material. Okay, mutation means the changes in genetic material in the cell. So types of gene mutations, as we discussed just now, we have base deletion, for example, thalassemia, base insertion, for example, cystic fibrosis, and base substitution, for example, sickle cell anemia. The short form is this, uh, standing for 
deletion, insertion, and substitution. Next, there are some examples of the uh, diseases caused by chromosomal mutation. So there are two types of chromosomal mutation, A, change in the number of chromosomes, and B, change in the structure of the chromosomes. Now for change in the number of chromosomes, we know that the normal number of chromosomes in a diploid uh, human, human diploid cell is 46. Okay, So Down syndrome uh, person has 47 chromosomes because of an extra chromosome number 21. So there are three chromosomes 21 in the each diploid cell. For Turner syndrome, in each diploid cell, there are 45 chromosomes only instead of 46. Because there's lacking one sex chromosome. So the number of chromosomes is 44 autosomes plus one X chromosome. Okay, then Kleinfelter syndrome, uh, this person has 47 chromosomes in each cell, that is 44 plus X, X, Y, okay, one extra sex chromosome. In Jacob syndrome, there are 47 chromosomes in each cell, and uh, that is 44 chromos autosomes plus 3 sex chromosome, X, Y, Y, there's an extra Y chromosome here, okay, in each cell. Now, for change in structure of chromosomes, we have deletion, inversion, duplication, or translocation, where the structure of the chromosomes is changed, right? And uh, the short form is DIDT. So, uh, this change in structure of chromosomes is different from change in the nucleotide or base sequence of DNA or the gene, okay? Because this one is shorter. I mean, the, the, the change is at a, on a smaller scale. Whereas for change in structure of chromosomes, a big section of the chromosome or certain part of the chromosome may be involved in the change. Okay, not just one gene. All right, so let's go on to the next question. Question 39. Diagram 22 shows the inheritance of the characteristic or ability to taste phenyl Theocarbamide, PTC, in a family. non colored symbol is for taster and colored symbol is for non-taster. Okay, so all the white shapes represent the tasters and the black shapes represent the non-tasters. So this ability to taste the compound or chemical substance PTC is actually inherited and it is caused by an allele, alright, that uh, causes the person to be able to taste uh, PTC, okay, allele or gene, huh? And similarly, for non-taster, non-taster is also determined by the allele for uh, inability to taste the PTC. All right? So there are, in this pedigree diagram, we see four generations. All right? Now, in generation one here, we see the two couples. Huh? We see two couples. One of them is a non-taster and the other is a taster. Okay? Similarly, for this couple two, this couple two. So uh, here we can see for the children in generation two, all the children are tasters. That means the trait of non-taster has disappeared. Okay, but in generation three, the children produced from generation two, uh, some of them are non-tasters. That means the trait of non-taster reappears again in generation three. So this tells us that the trait for non-taster, that means non-taster trait is actually a recessive trait. Okay, so what's the, how to explain this uh, observation? Now, in generation two here, we say that the non-taster trait disappears, okay, uh, because all are white shapes, huh? okay, but this non-taster married a, uh, this taster married a non-taster, okay, but the children of these two couples are actually all uh, Taster. So where did the non-taster trait disappear? Why is it it disappears? Because the dominant allele for taster, which you can represent with big T, okay, allele for taster, which is dominant, suppresses the effect of the recessive allele for non-taster, which we can represent with the symbol small t. Okay, that's why the non-taster trait was not able to be uh, manifest. Okay, was not able to be shown in the phenotypes of the children. So all the so the children could be, uh, must have the big T allele uh, for taster. All of them here uh, have the big T allele for taster. Now, 
Then in the third generation, generation three, we call it generation three, not the third generation, uh, generation three, non-tasted trait reappears again, okay, like these black symbols here, because each parent, let's say for this couple, uh, each parent gives one recessive allele, small t, to the child, okay, like this child here and this child, okay, to produce uh, the child which is homozygous recessive, okay, and the homozygous recessive genotype enables the recessive trait, that means of uh, non-taster, to manifest in the individual, okay. So if we were to assign uh, these two letters, big T and small t, all right, for taster and non-taster respectively, we can uh, more or less uh, conclude what these uh, genotypes will be, all right? So for the first couple here, the genotype, now, if it's a non-taster, which is a recessive trait, the individual must be homozygous recessive, having two small t, uh, alleles, okay, and uh, for this uh, spouse or husband in this case, he is a taster. That means he, he must have at least one big T allele. Huh? Uh, the other one could be small T or it could be big T also. Okay, so similarly for this couple, right? So uh, for the tasters, uh, they are either homozygous dominant or heterozygous. Huh? Homozygous dominant is big T, big T, and Heterozygous is big T, small t. Okay. Now, in this case, we can see three children here for this couple. They are all uh, tasters. Huh? So, we can assume, like, but we are not sure, that this parent here, the wife uh, here, is homozygous dominant. And all the children have inherited, this caused all the three children to inherit the big T allele from the mother. Okay. So, they are all tasters. Okay. Right, so this is one assumption, but uh, it could be that this mother could be a heterozygous individual like this one, okay, like having this genotype. Okay, now which of the following is correct about the inheritance of the characteristic? Non-taster trait is recessive trait. This is correct, okay, as we have explained just now. And also we can see from this uh, other pedigree diagram here, below here, you see the parent, uh, one is a non-taster and one is a taster, right? So, you can see that all the children are tasters. So, this tells us that the non-taster trait is the recessive trait. Uh, most probably, non-taster trait is the recessive trait because in this uh, generation 4, we can see that the children are all Tasters. That means the dominant allele for taster, big T, has suppressed the effect of the recessive allele for non-taster. Okay, that's why all the children are tasters. So this also proves our statement A here, okay, to be true. So basically, this uh, trait of ability to taste the phenyl theocarbamide or PTC in the family is uh, a type of monohybrid inheritance. Mendelian monohybrid inheritance, okay? Just like the inheritance of the uh, color of flower in the pea plant and so forth, okay? So if you look at the other uh, statements here, B, okay, let's look at B. Normal distribution graph is shown by this inheritance. This is not correct. Now, normal distribution graph is for continuous variation. So is the ability to taste Phenyl theocarbamide in a family, is it uh, continuous variation or discontinuous variation? It should be discontinuous variation because there are only two, uh, two phenotypes, uh, able to taste and not able to taste the PTC. All right? And then there are no intermediates in, for this. So this is a form of discontinuous variation. It's an example of discontinuous variation, okay? Uh, where the environment does not determine the the trait. Huh? It's only the genes that determine the trait. Okay. Now, C. Parents in first generation are heterozygous individuals. Not all the parents are heterozygous. Huh? 
For example, these black shapes show us that they are, the parents are taste, non-tasters, that means they are homozygous recessive, not heterozygous individuals like this individual here, uh, having one dominant allele and one recessive allele. Okay, this, are called, this is called a heterozygous individual. But uh, small t, small t is a homozygous recessive individual. Now D, the differences between individuals in this family is quantitative. This is true if it is continuous variation. But for the ability to taste PTC, this is uh, an example of discontinuous variation where the differences between the individuals is qualitative. Either they are either able to taste or not able to taste the PTC. So the answer is A. So the next question is about the CRISPR Cas9 editing tool, right? So I'm going to give you some background first. Now, this is found in the textbook page 286, but uh, you're asked to do your own research on CRISPR Cas9. So let's revise something about CRISPR Cas9, which is also important for uh, the exam, as this is a new type of technology, okay? So what is CRISPR Cas9? It is a gene editing tool to help scientists delete genes, insert genes, or modify the genetic content of uh, a person, all right? So it originated from a natural antiviral defense system in bacteria. That means the bacteria has this uh, natural defense system against viruses that attack the bacteria, and uh, it has this gene editing tool, all right? So uh, it's found first of all in bacteria, but scientists have modified it and now use it to edit the genes in the human cells, okay? So it consists of two main parts, the guide DNA RNA, which is used to recognize the DNA sequence. So here is the guide RNA as shown here, uh, this curved thing, okay? It is made up of one strand of polynucleotides, all right? And it has bases in it. It is used to recognize the DNA sequence that the scientist wants to uh, cut or edit, all right? And the Charles 9 enzyme is used to cut the DNA at the targeted location, for example, at this location here. All right. So, how does it work? First, the guide RNA binds to the targeted DNA sequence. Okay, now this guide RNA, gRNA RNA is the guide RNA, it will bind to the targeted gene sequence here. Okay, this part here. Okay, now this is a strand of DNA that consists of two strands of polynucleotides. And it, the DNA strand has opened up at this location here. Okay, now the guide RNA has located the DNA that needs to be cut, okay, at the target, targeted location. Next, the Chas9 enzyme will bind to the guide uh, RNA, okay, so this is the Chas9 enzyme. It's a big molecule here. And uh, using the guide RNA, is able to it has helped to locate the gene to be uh, cut, all right, or to be edited. So the Chas9 enzyme binds to the guide RNA, and then it will cut DNA strands at the specific location, all right, here. All right, now for example, in this DNA strand, maybe it's cut at this point here, okay, this point here, the cleavage or the cut here is actually at this point here, okay, just as an example. Then the scientists can introduce new sequences uh, of bases or new a new uh, section of DNA into the genome, into the genetic content of the cell, okay? As the DNA strands are being repaired, okay? So it can make changes. Scientists can make changes to the DNA, all right? And they can insert new genes or new DNA into the original strand of DNA, okay? First, they can delete the defective DNA, for example, DNA that is responsible for causing certain diseases, 40 DNA, all right, 40 genes that's responsible for causing certain diseases. They can be cut out. That means by, in that way, they are deleted and uh, that's, they are cut out using the CRISPR-Cas9 enzyme. And after that, new DNA can be inserted into the, uh, into the part that has been cut out, okay? So the new DNA can be joined to the original strand, long strand of DNA. So users, 
Genome editing may be used in the prevention and treatment of diseases such as the single gene disorders such as cystic fibrosis, hemophilia, and sickle cell anemia. So we take the example of hemophilia. Hemophilia is caused by a defective gene on the sex chromosome X, right? Where the gene is, doesn't have the normal code okay, for production of certain blood clotting factors. So roughly, okay, speaking, maybe scientists can take out the defective gene or damaged gene, and then they can insert the normal gene for production of blood clotting factor into the uh, person's cell. All right, that is a, a basic way that gene editing can be used in the prevention and treatment of diseases. Okay, so now we are ready to try the question. So now let's look at this question. Developments in biotechnology enable the use of the CRISPR technology to cut genomes during gene therapy. Which of the following statements are correct about the CRISPR technology? Number one, normal gene is inserted into the cell by using virus. Now, this is not mentioned at all, right? So, in the explanation, now let's look at number two first. Chas9 enzyme cuts the, broken, cuts the broken DNA, which has been identified. Correct. The enzyme is used to cut the DNA, uh, maybe the damaged DNA, not broken DNA, uh, damaged DNA, all right? To cut out the damaged DNA so that it can be replaced with the uh, DNA that is functional and normal, okay? Now, so number two is correct, all right? Number two is correct. Now let's go on. Now what's the use of the RNA? So this is the guide that RNA it is used to identify the damaged gene that needs to be cut. Yes, it is used to identify uh, or recognize the damaged gene and it will guide the uh, Chas9 enzyme to the damaged gene. Okay, then the Chas9 enzyme will cut out the damaged gene. As simple as that. So number three is in. Now the presence of virus in the body system may induce immune response. Nothing to do with the presence of virus. Okay, for this... Uh, CRISPR technology. So the answer is 2 and 3 is B. Okay? Right, that's all for this lesson. How did you fare? Now you can compare your score to this score chart. This is just a rough uh, idea of what your grade would look like, all right, would be if you have a particular score, all right? So I've just converted the scores huh, based on 20 marks to the total marks of 100 marks, okay? And if you have 18 to 20, you get A+, plus. 16 or 17 is A, 15, which is about 75% is uh, A-, minus, right? Uh, for B, is uh, 70 to 74, and then uh, C is uh, 60 to 69, uh, so it's the score of 13 or 12, and then D is uh, 10 to 10 and 11 marks, okay? Below that is like uh, haven't uh, reached the passing mark, okay? So if you haven't fed well, well, this is a tough test because there are quite a number of hot questions. So don't be discouraged if you haven't uh, fed well or did well, right, based on your expectations. Just continue to work hard and try more trial paper questions and you will improve, right? Apart from that, do uh, read through the notes and memorize the main points. So thanks for viewing. Please do share, like and subscribe and goodbye for now.